Good evening. My name is Jet Likings. Welcome to another episode of Taking It to Redline, where we interview your favorite people in the automotive and supercar community. Tonight, we have a special guest for you. This person is a professional realtor with a successful brand, Cars and Castles. They have a YouTube channel with over 70 million views, 900 videos, and 300,000 plus subscribers. They are fluent in Japanese, have run a Japanese company while living in Japan. Folks, this is one of your favorites from the automotive and supercar community. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Feldman, a.k.a. Steve's POV. Steve, thanks for joining us this evening. How are you doing? Hey, thank you for having me. I'm doing terrific. Uh, it's a beautiful night here in Texas, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. You're staying healthy during these times? Oh, yeah. Feeling good working out, drinking my red wine, and uh, doing my exercise, and uh, and having fun, man, and and thumbs up always. So uh, yeah, we're doing good, man. I, I really, really enjoying life here in Texas. And it looks like you're all settled in. I mean, you even have the Steve's POV logo on the Texas flag right there. So <laughs> Abs <laughs> Love it. absolutely. I got settled in ready for meetings in here and setting up my studio in the garage right now and uh, a lot more fun content on the way. Awesome, man. Well, we're looking yep. forward to it. Um, if you. you don't mind, we'll get right started. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. So we have a couple topics for you tonight. Um, we're going to dive right into Japan. So um, from what I remember from watching your videos is you went to college at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. You took a Japanese class. Uh, you were somewhat out of place, but you wanted to continue with the language and the culture. So you took an offer from a fellow student to work a chicken farm in Japan. Can you please explain what settling into Japan was like and when and how the transfer to the car scene happened? I'm going to go back a little bit because I want to, I want to take you back quickly before that. I, I had no interest. In, I'm 51 this year. I, um, when I was growing up, uh, really, I had no interest in, in Japan whatsoever. I, I grew up in New York and New Jersey. I grew up around American muscle cars, hot rods, uh, you know, chop top 32 Fords, 34 Fords, uh, 49 to 51 Mercs, Camaros, Mustangs. Absolutely nothing Japanese. In fact, I had no interest whatsoever. And then I got to the University of Wisconsin and started studying business. And now we're talking about the late 80s um, uh, at that time. And Japan back then for you young people was um, uh, about to become the number one economy in the entire world. Uh, people were saying uh, Japan will be number one economy in the world. Cars, electronics, everything was in Japan's hands. And it fascinated me. And it, to me, it was something as I started to study business at Wisconsin, we were learning a lot about the way Japanese did business, the, the group think and the group work ideals and the just-in-time inventory concepts and some of these other things that are part of and part of a country that is very small, very compact, doesn't have natural resources, but yet figure out a way to be figure out after being defeated in war, just, you know, you're talking about 30, 40 years before that, you're right, uh, to the United States rebuilt to become the number one economy. I thought it was fascinating. I thought it was interesting. I started studying Japanese and I got hooked. I got hooked um, really hardcore into the culture and everything else. And then I met lots of Japanese exchange students who were at the University of Wisconsin. Two of those guys uh, were the sons of, of the owner of a big chicken farm, Japan's number one chicken farm in Saitama uh, Prefecture. And we became friends and we would go out at night and hang out. And they said, if you'd like, you can go to Japan in the summer and spend um, a uh, couple of months to three months on the chicken farm. Uh, what, we won't be there, but you could stay in our room and you could work there. You could make some money, teach some English, do whatever. And I said, that was my opportunity to go and to immerse myself in a culture. And I wound up there in the middle of uh, the summer, the hot, balmy, sticky, humid summer in Japan. And uh, in the middle of very rural area with uh, only Japanese people. And for me, that became the key to learning the culture, learning the language, assimilating, learning traditions, learning things that I never would have thought if I probably wasn't in that place that I wound up on a chicken farm, something I'd never been on a farm before growing up in New York, I'm born in the Bronx and grew up in New Jersey. We didn't have any chicken farms where I came from, but so I wound up in a different work environment. I wound up uh, in a different language, in a different setting, different culture. And um, it really worked for me. I came back to the University of Wisconsin. Then I think I was a junior uh, or a senior at that time. Uh, and I felt confident that I could learn the language. I felt confident I could do better at the language than anybody else in the class at that time, kids who had been to Japan multiple times. And um, I, was, I was set, that was, that was the beginning of my career really after that three months in Japan on the chicken farm. Hmm. 
Wow. And uh, hot and balmy, you know, working at a chicken farm uh, does not sound like the place to be, but you made it through it. <laughs> it, it. It was what it was. You know, I was there. I could have made it miserable and disgusting. I mean, which it was at times in a hot, balmy, sticky, crap filled chicken pen. I mean, we're talking about a million chickens on this farm. This isn't like, you know, a couple hundred, a couple thousand chickens. This was an egg farm with several different farms, you know, as part of the entire conglomerate all in one area of Saitama. And it was nasty. It was sticky. It was smelly. It was gross. We used to go into the cages. One of my jobs was to go into the cages and grab chickens would be two or three in a cage at, at that time. No free roaming chickens on this farm and um, <laughs> nothing organic about these days. Right. So the chickens would fight and, and there was always a weaker chicken. So they would kind of start, you could tell they were not going to make it. My job was to go into the cages, pull those weak chickens out, basically grab them by their heads, grab them by their legs, yank real hard, separate their necks from their, th from their, you know, spinal cords, I imagine, and throw them in the pile and burn them. And that was, uh, and, and then clean up all the shit that was all over uh, the place, yeah. excuse my language. No uh, never did it, but I was, that was, it was, it was an experience. It's something I look back at, I'm so glad I did. I experienced, I worked with all Japanese people. I, I ate lunch with Japanese old ladies who would watch their TV drama, the, you know, the TV shows during lunch and, you know, see things and learn things, picked up on things. And I think I really had the ability to assimilate into a culture being in a rural part of the country, as opposed to a city where maybe there were other Americans and other English speaking people. But for me, that was the start. And it was also the start of me seeing Japan and seeing cars that I'd never, ever seen before, skylines mm -hmm. and, and bluebirds and atessas and familias and I mean, and big horns and these trucks and all the Japanese things that I'd never seen before. I said, wow, Japan has cool cars, not just these crappy little cars that as I was growing up, we saw coming in that people were buying because they were good on gas mileage during the gas shock in the seventies. Mm -hmm. There were really cool performance cars and it, it worked for me. Everything worked for me at that point. Wow. That's yeah. That, that chicken, that chicken story is definitely <laughs> graphic. I definitely won't forget that. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, was, did you get into the car scene there in the late eighties, you know, early nineties in Japan, or, I mean, is, was there a car scene there? Obviously, you know, here in the States, we had, you know, the muscle car shows. I mean, it was a big thing Saturday, Sunday, you know, go to the parking lots or go to the fields and, you know, um, show off your car. Did they have that in Japan back then? So they probably did back in Japan. They probably did quite a bit. Unfortunately, where I was in the middle of nowhere with no transportation, no car of my own, and, and really not a lot of information on what was going on uh, at the time, I didn't really take part in a lot of it. But just meeting people, I, I, I'll tell you a funny story. One night, okay, and, and you know, I'll admit to get on this, but I was bored. And one of us was still in America, had a, had a dirt bike. It was street legal, but it was a dirt bike like a Honda or Yamaha or something at the time. And I, I wanted to go out. And I, I just saw that thing sitting there. And I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going out. I'm going for a ride. And I jumped on that Yamaha motorcycle. Um, it pro probably shouldn't have um, at the time. But I, I drove around into a town and I stopped at a gas station. And at that time in Japan, there wasn't a lot of foreigners there. Now there's a lot of, you know, Americans. There's a lot of foreigners from all over the world. And I'm in a rural area. And I went into this town and I stopped at a gas station to fill up the, 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 the motorcycle tank and took off my helmet. And the guys at the gas station went crazy. They were like, oh. Oh my God. Oh my God. You know, like I'd never seen an American before. And they, we started talking and we became friends and I started hanging out with these guys and they were into cars and motorcycles and into soccer and into off-roading and stuff. And we became this, a good bunch of friends, you know, and they, they had a Jeep and I remember we hung out and, and um, even though it wasn't car related, they were in the cars, they were car guys and we became friends and they didn't have really super nice cars at the time, but the Jeep they had and a couple of the other things, Land Cruiser, I think that at the time we, drove in it. We, we hung out and, and I don't know, I think I met car people as a more, more than just necessarily car shows at the time, but I knew there was awesome cars and there was an awesome car culture in Japan as a result of that trip. Hmm. That, that, that's awesome. Now, it, you know, I know you ran the Japanese company or helped run a Japanese company and that was most likely afterwards. So, I mean, was that into, you know, the, the mid or even late nineties or what, when was that? So after that trip to Japan, I, got, I went back to the University of Wisconsin, and I, before I graduated, I entered something called the uh, uh, Japanese Speech Language Contest. It's hosted in Chicago by the American and the Japanese consulates, 
and the, and the uh, chambers of commerce of both countries. And I uh, entered the seventh annual Japanese speech language contest. And at that contest, I spoke about my experience on the chicken farm. In fact, I wore the chicken farm uniform at the time on stage and it was a hit, needless to say. Most people there were talking about cultural differences and trade frictions and, and other things like that, you know, boring kind of hard, just kind of like put you to sleep topics. And I show up with this big hat on with this big bill to keep the poo from coming on your head and a, and a big uniform with the company's name on it and, and rubber boots up to my knees. And I tell the story of being on a chicken farm for three months and I won this contest. And the first place prize was a first class round trip ticket on Japan Airlines. At that time, over $10,000 was that ticket. And at that time, we were pre-internet days. This is 1992, 1993. Uh, really not a lot of internet going on. But uh, through the uh, Japanese program at the University of Wisconsin, I started uh, getting some uh, contact from Japanese companies that were in the United States. And they were offering me job opportunities to work for them in Chicago and other places. And I went and I met some of these companies and I interviewed and I declined their offers because I said I wanted to be in Japan. At that time, there wasn't a lot of Japanese uh, American people or foreigners working in Japan. Not many Japanese companies were willing to sponsor a foreigner to work in Japan. But I wanted to be in Japan. I declined their offers politely and respectfully, but they led to a company, a computer company outside of Tokyo, uh, an introduction to them. And as I went over on that free uh, flight that I won, I went to interview with that company and I was hired by them to come back and live and work in Japan starting in about 1993, 1994 until 1999. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked for a company and I slowly, I quickly got bored working for a company. And I broke off and I started my own company in Japan. At that time, we were doing imported housing from the United States, bringing small uh, houses to Japan and building them American style. I was doing wristwatches. I was uh, doing video rights licensing and a lot of other stuff there for uh, five or six years on my own before I came back and moved to California. And what does, why did you move back to California? Why not stay there? <clears throat> well, Japan's a beautiful place. It's a great place, uh, it, it, but it's a small place. It's a cramped place. It's an expensive place. And I, I was traveling back and forth quite a bit to Los Angeles and seeing how people were living there and how big houses were and beautiful open roads and, and cars and just things that I said, wow, I can probably continue to do the same stuff I'm doing with Japan, but be an American, do it in a, in a more of a open kind of a, a, a you know, a, a low cost, beautiful location like California and still do business with Japan. So I, my wife, uh, well, who became my wife after that, but um, somebody I'd met in Wisconsin who, who became my wife, um, she was into that as well. We decided to move to California, and um, that's where we started. That was where, where my son was born, in fact. Uh, the kid who was on the videos a lot with me. That, that's awesome. So let's continue the dialogue back to the United States and, and uh, get back into you and your cars here in the States, obviously. Um, you have a garage yes. that most people, I mean, would you know love just any one of your cars. And I mean, you have, you have, you have a ton of them. Um, Anyways, I want to go through a couple of your cars um, and if you could explain, you know, how and why you acquired them and then just briefly, you know, if you have any, you know, major mods or something like that, you know, tell us. But I want to first start off with the Hako and I got to ask you, what is the proper way to pronounce the, the Hako Ska? Is it Hako Ska? Hako Suka? I mean, I've heard this a million different ways and I got to ask you, how do you say it correctly? Hako Ska. If you broke it down, Hakosuka, Hakoska. Hakoska is the, pr 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 the proper pronunciation of that word. People bastardize it here. It's, 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 uh, it's quite, I've heard lots of variations of it. Um, you can call it a Hako for short. The, the origins of the word are Hako means square, okay, square body. Ska comes from skyline. It's short for skyline. It's a square bodied skyline. Hako, square, ska is an abbreviation of skyline. So a square body skyline becomes a hakoska. And Good. that's how it's pronounced, hakoska. And um, that is probably my favorite car of all. It is a car actually, when I was living in Japan, I bought once, I owned one. And um, I kind of wanted one so badly because I thought it was the coolest Japanese car of all. And I bought one back when they were really, really cheap still. And uh, I owned it for a short time, and, but I ran out of money and I was going to leave Japan and I had no plans for the car and I sold the car really cheap. And it happened to be red and black, just like the one I wound up acquiring later when after I started my channel. 
where I went to Japan, got a hot tip on one in Nagoya. I woke up in the morning, I rented a car from Tokyo. I drove all the way to Nagoya real early. I went to my friend's place, uh, Azuru Motoring in, in, uh, in Nagoya, and I saw this car and I bought it. I bought it and it was uh, red and black, just like the one I had owned, but it was totally wide body, very uh, Boso Zoku or Zokusha style, which is this wide, very, very old school kind of, you know, traditional way of customizing cars. Uh, kind of what Liberty Walk does today, but from the old days with the massive big fenders on the car. And I bought the car and um, I left it in Japan to do a little bit of body work because I like the real big fenders, but my thought was to go with the semi works fenders, not the full works, which is the huge, huge wide ones. I went with the semi wide ones and I left it in Japan to do the body work. I, I called up my friends at Liberty Walk. I did a little swapping and trading with Mr. Kato for some parts that were on the car and some parts that I wanted for the car. And we got the work done and then I brought the car to the United States and it is, um, it is the coolest car. It's the most iconic car. It's uh, amazing how well known a car that was never in the United States is to young people, even in the U S I mean, you know, a car is cool when people don't even know, have to know what it is to look at it and say, damn, that car is cool. And, and most car guys look at that car and say, that car is cool. Yeah, I mean, it, it's my favorite out of your collection. I'm sorry. Some people might like your 458 or something else, but it's get definitely my favorite car and probably one of my dream cars to have in my garage one day. So I just, I, I awesome love car. that thing. Awesome car. Very hard to buy, very hard to find, very hard to get. Um, not many of them around anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, Japan, a lot of guys don't want to let go of what they have. So while it's hard to find, I, I feel very fortunate to have mine. And the Japanese are very honored, I think, when people here buy a car like that, a legendary car, and bring it here and see that it's being well taken care of, that it's being out, it's getting driven, it's not in the rain, it's not being exposed to rust and elements. And while many people, it's a hard thing for, for Japanese to chew on that a legendary Japanese legend like that left Japan and may never ever make it back to Japan. Um, you know, and in some ways, listen, going back to muscle cars, people here, when a 70 Hemi Kuda went to Japan back in the 90s. People cried, people bit their tongue, people got very worried about the fact that these cars that were you know, legendary, uh, rare cars that they would never come. Japan took those cars because they loved them. They, they didn't bastardize them or, or destroy them. They kept them in collections. And in fact, now that you know, the economy has been bad in Japan for many, many years, many of those cars have made their way back out of Japan and back here again. Hmm. So when the Japanese see a car like my skyline and it's being kept well and being enjoyed by many people. I think many people are happy to see that and honored by that uh, in Japan. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, speaking of Liberty Walk, the 458. Now, yes. kind of interesting in your fleet of cars. Um, why was the 458 your first supercar? I mean, why not? I mean, I know a Porsche, a lot of people don't you know, call that a supercar. Why not like an RWB or something like that? Why a 458? So my first supercar actually was a, was a 360 um, a Spider, a 360 Modena a Spider uh, um, a Ferrari. And um, that was my first car. That was way, way, you'd have to go way back to the first few episodes of uh, Steve's POV to find where I bought after driving a 430. Um, my friend had a 360 and I bought it from a yellow and navy blue car, very unique color. I owned it and I didn't modify that car much other than exhaust and other stuff, but um, that car was the beginning of the channel days. And that car was one of the cars that I owned when I met Mr. Cato from Liberty Walk in the United States in Pasadena. There's video about this on my channel at the Rose Bowl, there was a show. And we were actually, me and my son at the time were talking about why we never see Japanese people, all these Japanese cars, but we never see Japanese people at American car meets. You saw Vietnamese guys, you saw Filipinos, you saw you know, uh, other Asian people there at the events and obviously white and black and, you know, people of all colors. But of ethnicity, there was rarely any Japanese guys showing up at the events where all these Japanese cars were being featured all over. And my son and I would always talk about why is there not more Japanese guys involved here? There's the Japanese in LA. Why are they not here? And all of a sudden we turn around and in comes this Murcielago with a wide body, a BMW M3 with a wide body and uh, another car, I think. And, and four, five, six Japanese guys pile out of the car. And I said, Whoa. And my son said, dad, dad, it's Japanese guys. Japanese guys are here. I said, really? Who are they? Had no idea who they were. Didn't know who Mr. Kato was. Didn't know Liberty Walk. Didn't know anything. Went up in Japanese, introduced myself and said, can I interview you? He said, yeah, sure. And Mr. Kato and I met that day for the first time and we hit it off. We became very good friends. 
And that was the first, I think one of their first times in America actually getting that BMW M3, their first car kind of out on the market for sale there. And then they had their Murcielago that was here that they used as a display car. And then they were about to build their first four or five, eight. And I was part of that build at LTMW in LA where I stopped by, saw how they were cutting it, became very good friends with Mr. Cato. And I said, you know what, one day when I get into a, the, the, another supercar after I sold the 360, the 458 is an awesome car, um, technologically awesome. The prices at that time were just dropping when I decided to buy it, bought it. And I knew I wanted Japanese style, Japanese flair with it. Now in the intern, another character comes into this whole equation. His name is Mr. Morohoshi. Mr. Morohoshi is the guy who you probably know from the, a lot of guys think he's a, a, a mafia Yakuza in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, contrary, he is not, but uh, they, they think he is. Uh, he drives the flashy Lamborghinis. He's got all the LED lights. If you watch Tokyo Midnight Lambo Run and all the videos, some of my early viral videos, in fact, were about these, the Lambo crew in Japan, my Lambo crew, at home, the guys with all the flashy cars. And I gotta tell you, I never saw anything like that in my life. But I became friends with Mr. Morohoshi and his whole crew. And I became friends with Mr. Kato and his whole crew. And these are different groups, by the way. These are factions. These are not necessary buddies, mm -hmm. right? They, they, they don't necessarily love each other's styles. But here's Steve, the guy who kind of bridges the two, the gap between the two. And I kind of was influenced by both. And I said, you know, one day I want a Liberty Walk car and I want to put some LED lights and do kind of like Mr. Morohoshi did. And uh, I, I, I practiced first on an RX-7 that I had at the time, an FD put crazy LED lights all over it. It was cool. And I said, you know, when I get an, uh, and, and it took a while. People in LA didn't get it. You know, people called me funny names, uh, some words that we probably are not allowed to say uh, or shouldn't say nowadays. But, you know, there were some negative comments to, toward it. But I think people liked it and it was different. Nobody really had it. And, and people started liking it. And I started liking it. It grew on me. And I said, when I get a, a Liberty Walk car one day, a, a Ferrari, I'm going to join it together with Mr. Morohoshi style too kind of create a unique Steve's POV version car, uh, which is what the current uh, uh, 458 uh, Liberty Walk with the uh, wrap and the lights and, and everything else on it is kind of a, a, a culmination of, is kind of all those relationships, plus my love of different things in Japan, putting it all together into that car. I mean, I love it. It's definitely one of a kind. I love your wrap. I mean, I love the lights too. And you just, you don't see that. I mean, everybody's throwing, not everybody, but a lot of people are throwing Liberty Walk kits on, you know, the big wings, straight yep. pipe and them, you name it. But not everybody's doing that whole light thing that, you know, they are over in Japan. And I, I just, I absolutely love that car. So thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. I, I, uh, I love it too. Um, I like the wrap we came up with. It's unique. It's different. There's not another one uh, like it around. And, and that's, that's the point of these cars, you know, in Japan, why do people put Liberty Walk kits on their cars? Why do guys uh, put lights on their Lamborghinis and, and do what those guys do? It's because you want to stand out. You know, we're talking about a country where you're taught that in school, you know, the, the nail that stands out gets hammered down. Okay. If you, very, there's very similar, there's rules that people oh, 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 adhere to those rules. They, they are brought up to talk when you talk to, not to talk when you're not spoken to. They're different than what we've grown up uh, with. And, uh, but these guys, whether it be Liberty Walk, whether it be, they, they didn't really adhere to that kind of social rule in Japan very well. They were kind of standouts and they didn't mind standing out. So now when you have a Lamborghini, you may already stand out just because you have a Lamborghini, but you don't stand out enough when there's 20 other Lamborghinis. So why not uh, customize it? Why not wide body it? Why not make it loud and obnoxious? Why not put lights all over it? And essentially that's what happens. And, you know, I love that style. They're not scared to put a knife or a grinding wheel to a three, four, five hundred thousand dollar car. It's their car. They love it. They like it. They're going to do what they like to do. I, I, and I subscribe to that. You know, it's your car. You want to do what you want to do to it. You're free to do it. Do it. Don't yeah. be ashamed. Don't care what other people say. It's your car. Enjoy it. Do your own thing, right? Yeah. Do your own thing, man. And, and that brings me to the, uh, the I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need your help for the pronunciation on this as well. But this brings me to the, the, the K truck, right? Yes. I mean, you live in Texas. Texas yes. is the home of pickup trucks. I mean, you've been down there for a little bit. You see all these jacked up, lifted bro dozers. Um, yep. Why the K truck? I mean, how is that driving that little truck in Texas? And it, it, am I saying it correctly? Is it K truck or you is it key truck? K, K. Okay. K means small in Japan. 
and it falls into a class of vehicles that you'll normally see in Japan with yellow, sometimes black license plates that refer to cars that are under, I believe, a thousand cc's in, in engine size, a small size like that. And they're cheaper to register in Japan. They're obviously very gas economical and they're used on farms and, and used in rural areas and used in the city too for delivering stuff. Um, that particular truck, my truck that I bought is a Honda Acti. It's a 1990 or 91, I believe. That truck has an engine in, in the rear. It's a midship, just like a Ferrari, if some might say. In fact, in Japan, you know what that truck is referred to? As the farmer's Ferrari. <laughs> the farmer's Ferrari, because it's a midship little truck. It's fun to drive. It's five-speed manual. That's not this, of course, but it's a five-speed manual and it is fun. And in Texas, I gotta tell you something. Um, it's more popular than a Ferrari is. It's more popular than maybe even a Skyline is in a lot of cases. People love that truck. And I love it. And I think it's cool. And I always thought they were cool. But I'm about to make it so cool and so different. And so I'm in Texas. So, And I like trucks. I've always loved trucks. I've loved semis. I love tractor trailers, 18-wheelers. Smoking the Bandit is a movie I've watched thousands of times. Okay. Um, so, And I'm American who loves Japan. And I got a Japanese right-hand drive truck and I'm in Texas. Let your mind go wild a little bit. And I'm, I'm not going to tell you any bit more, but over the next couple of months, watch what I do with that truck. And I think you'll see the most unique. And I'm not saying from a power perspective, you know, people want, you know, like Hayabusa's and you hear all these different, yeah, maybe, but more on the looks perspective. I'm going to make that little truck blend in in Texas in a way that nobody else has ever done. I'll wow. leave it at that. Yeah, it's not what I was thinking. Um, I'm sure you saw my post on Instagram. I thought you're going to go like the 13B rotary direction, but it almost sounds like you're going to go possibly lifted with some tires. So I'm I'm looking forward to that. That's that's going to be it, interesting. <laughs> leave it open, but I'm telling you, it's going to be unique. It's going to be different. I think it'll be um, real popular. The Japanese love the fact that I have a truck like that here. I think going in and parking that little truck next to those big monster pickup trucks, those big semis, I think it's, it's cool. I think it's so cool. And you'd be surprised at so many people who are interested in that truck more than any, almost any other car that I own. People stop and ask about that truck. Oh, heck yeah. I can't even yeah. tell you. I don't think I've ever seen one on the road, to be honest with you. <laughs> They're oh. around, they're popping up. You're going to see more and more and guys on farms in Texas have them as their, as their um, garbage uh, can hauler as what they use to haul from the ranch out to the, to the street, their garbage cans to move stuff around. That's what they do. So um, they're out there, believe it or not. And uh, I think they're fantastic trucks. And I encourage anybody in the United States, a 25 year old and older uh, one, you can legally import. They're fantastic and fun. And it's not about speed all the time. It's, 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 you can have so much fun in a little truck like that. I, I can't tell you. Smiles all the way. I'm going to have to keep my eyes open for one of those. <laughs> um, let's switch gears a little bit and uh, go over to YouTube. So yes. um, obviously you have a successful YouTube channel. I mean, I think you're at what, 346,000 subs plus. Um, how did plus. you get plus? <laughs> yeah, sorry. No problem. No problem. How, how did you get into that? So I, I had done a lot of businesses over the years um, and um, um, uh, Japan's economy, I started to say before, kind of kind of started the bubble burst, as they say, after the uh, late, later 90s, uh, mid 90s, later 90s, the bubble burst from the big econ economic boom. And Japan's economy slowly, slowly, slowly started to go down and down and down. And uh, you could probably see sky popping in here a little bit. <laughs> um, I needed to, uh, the, a lot of businesses and things I were doing were not going as well as um, they were previously. And I needed to kind of change directions in what I was doing. And um, so I was thinking about how do you, how do I get about letting people know that there's this guy who's non-Japanese, who lives in America, who speaks Japanese fluently, who knows cars, who knows business, who can consult and do other stuff regarding to the Japanese market. How do I get out there and, and do that and kind of do it in an interesting way? At the time, my son was 12 or 13 years old. He was getting into photography. He was already in the cars. And at his birthday, he wanted to get a, um, a, a DSLR camera. And I told him I would buy him a DSLR ca camera if he agreed to come to the car shows with me on the weekend. We go out to the shows, I'll grab a mic, he holds the camera and I start reporting about what car life in the United States was all about. What, 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 what we do on weekends to enjoy car life in America. And that was episode one. And from there, just kind of took it from there. Let's go out on the weekends, to film some cool cars. Let's talk about what we do in America as Americans for cars. Let's do it in Japanese. 
And at the end of every video, let's say to people, hey, um, you know, if you like the video, if you're interested in discussing any business opportunities, please email me. I put that at the end of every, every Japanese video, uh, every video at the time. And people started emailing me. And I started going to Japan and had kind of people to meet and started getting into different collections and started meeting more people. And next thing I know, I started getting people that would, you know, were asking me to help them sell cars or buy cars or auction cars or connect them with some companies or find them some business. And it started leading to a lot of new businesses for me, opportunities. I never started YouTube thinking that I would be earning money from YouTube. I kind of looked at it as a free way to kind of do some fun stuff, promote myself and get people to come back to me and hopefully create new business opportunities. Um, and that it did, it did do that. And then over time, as the, as the video started to monetize and as I started gaining enough subscribers and you know hit whatever threshold, I started earning money from the videos. And eventually that started growing and growing and growing. And thankfully it's still growing, thankfully. And it also led to people asking me about real estate stuff because I became a realtor during that time as well and did that. And, and I thought if I, if I could sell Steve to people, meaning this is who I am, this is what I like, you don't, yeah, I get it. Not everybody's going to like me. Not everybody's going to like the Japanese thing and everybody, but this is who I am. This is what I do. I'm a realtor and a YouTuber and I'm not going to BS you. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to give you straight up talk and help you negotiate a great deal for a house. You're, you know, watch me on YouTube. You don't have to interview me. You, you can see who I am. I'm not going to be anybody different. I promise off of camera than I am on camera. This is me. Um, let's work together. And, you know, in the meantime, now it's fun to do videos, build, do stuff with my son together. We make money from the videos, obviously from, from, from YouTube monetization. I have people who come and sponsor the channel and sponsor our bills. And then if I sell a few houses in between, I'm happy too. And, and that's be, kind of become the the, the start to kind of current and, and how I've approached YouTube. Yeah. That, I mean, that's an awesome story, especially with the father, son, the bonding, you know, you started off with it and you continued too because a lot of people yes. enter business and you end up hating each other afterwards, obviously your family, but that that's really cool. And then to see your successful, you know uh, you know, realtor position as well, grow throughout that. That's really cool. Now, if we just fast forward um, you know, obviously you've collaborated with some other, you know, YouTube um, content creators like Daily Driven Exotics. How did you ever run yes. into them? So uh, Daily Driven Exotics, uh, uh, um, basically Damon started his channel about the same time, uh, maybe a little bit before I did. I didn't know Damon at all. I had seen that one uh, Lamborghini's uh, something he had done or, or, or Lamborghini snow drifting or something. He did. I, I went on the Gold Rush rally, Gold Rush number six or seven. Um, on there. And I brought a car from Japan, a wide body Ford GT, a custom car called the Belladonna Ford GT. It's a crazy custom car. I brought it from Japan um, and entered the Gold Rush rally. And on that rally was Damon. And again, didn't know him, but we wound up in a room one night and hanging, drinking, having fun and talking. And, and um, I guess my Japanese background kind of intrigued Damon and his motivation, his, his focus on what he was doing kind of motivated me. We became friendly. We became really friendly at the time. And he said to me, he said, man, one day I want to go to Japan, but I only want to go if it's you. I said, yeah, of course, man. Let's do it one day. Sure, 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 whatever, right? And Damon kept growing his channel. And I was kind of part-time doing what I was doing. And he blew up, right? The Daily Driven Exotics took off. And um, then one day I'm in Japan and I posted something on, on, on Instagram. And all of a sudden I get a text from Damon. He says, man, we want to go to Japan. We want to go with you. I said, sure, let's do it, man. Let's do it. And we came up with that trip that we did. And Dave, Damon, and I, I brought them to Japan and uh, showed them stuff that they had never seen before. Took them uh, out, introduced them to people. We had the best six or seven days. We did a rally in Japan called the World X Series Rally. Um, we met all of my friends. We got the crazy cars together. And we created seven or eight videos at the time that still today people come up to me and said, man, those videos were the best, the best videos. Uh, you know, we love DDE, but of, of the DDE videos, those were the most incredible videos. We love you, Steve, and what you do and, and, and that. And, and I became part of the DDE family at that time. Damon had a, had, a, had a vision of the DDE family. And the DDE family was, you know, it was Alex and Amelia and, and Steve and Raymond and Damon and, and the group of guys that were all part of those videos during that time that you saw open up in the um, uh, beginning of their videos. And... Um, it was fun. It was so much fun. And we, and, and, you know, I really respect Damon. 
I learned a lot from Damon. For me, the collaboration was terrific because being a Japanese language main channel in, in my case, I, I, I know a lot of people, American people and other English speaking people don't like reading subtitles. People didn't know who I was. But when I got on DDE, people figured out who I was. And many people came over and became fans. Many people said, oh man, this Chinese stuff, this Japanese stuff's not for us. We don't wanna watch, but it's okay. I, I got exposure to a different market. DDE got exposure to the Japan market. And um, even now, you know, DDE's locked up in Canada. I'm here. Um, I'm working with them for Facebook, for other things now, creating new content for them. And we're gonna continue. We're gonna go back to Japan again. And too bad you're not in, in Texas anymore. But as soon as that border opens and they can come down here again, we're going to get 10,000 or more people together in Dallas, Texas for a huge park up front DDE reunion in Texas. I'm telling you, it's coming. It's going to come sooner than later. People in Texas and all around here can look forward to it. It's going to be awesome. Awesome. So I think Damon's been hinting at that for a little bit now, obviously yes. with his new brand, JDM Space. He's been asking his audience, you know, California or Texas, you know, we're coming. And I was like, why is he going to Texas? Obviously the Ferrari's down there getting the twin turbo build, but now it makes sense. So um, Steve's POVs in Texas. Steve's POV is part of the DD family. And I told him, I said, Damon, you need to spend more time in Texas. I've been in LA. I've been there. Nothing against LA, nothing against California whatsoever, what at all. But there is a beautiful car scene here in Texas. It is, there are unbelievable amount of hardcore fans here in Texas of daily driven exotics and Steve's POV. Um, it is different than LA in many ways, but it's fantastic. And I want to share with Damon kind of like, and Dave, kind of like how I share with them, Japan. I want to share with them, Texas, the culture here, the car culture, which I think is absolutely fantastic, diverse, unique, JDM, supercar. It doesn't matter. Everybody here is, is, is cool. That's what I feel about it. And um, I, I want to share that with them. And, and, and I can't wait for that day to come. I'm looking forward to it. You might have to give me a heads up of when that's going to be. I'm going to hop on a plane and make sure I'm down there. I still come got places down. to be and places to stay down there in Dallas, Fort Worth. So that, that is awesome. And thank you for that intel. That is just you great, Steve. You got behind the scenes intel there. It, exactly. You heard it first from Steve's POV. Right here on Redline News Network. <laughs> nice. So, Steve, uh, let's get into our final um, section here. It's called sequential. Sure. So think of it yes. like a sequential shifter in your car. I'm going to give you some rapid fire questions. First thing that comes to mind, just say it out loud. So uh, are you ready? Right. I'm going to try. I'll All do right. My best. NGK or Denso? Denso. R34 GTR, FD RX7 or NSX? RX7, FD. If you could import one car under the 25 year rule that you currently don't have, what would it be? Uh, Ken Mary. That's um, the next after the Hakko Sky. That's the next Skyline. Okay. Favorite Japanese cuisine? Did you get that? Next generation Skyline? Yeah. Yep. Uh, okonomiyaki. Not a lot of people know what that is. It's a Japanese pancake. They kind of say what it is, but okonomiyaki. Delicious. Okay. And this might make some people mad, depending on your answer. In and out burger or what a burger? In and out, sorry. Oh it's wow. In and out for me still. Yeah, nice. I like the Whataburger. I do. I really did. But uh and I've been here now and I've I've had the chance to have a, a few of them. I'll tell you what it is to simplify that answer. I, I like them both. I, I said on our way to Texas that Whataburger was a true burger and without the sauce and the other things that maybe In and Out has. Honestly, though, after the customer service experience, the whole experience too, if you take that all into account, I'm going with in and out. Sorry, I'm, gonna have to, I'm gonna have to side with you on that one as well, even though I lived in Texas for many years, so. <laughs> in, and no. out, in and out is good, it's hard to beat it, man. Animal style. Yep. Animal style. <laughs> <laughs> no, Steve. Definitely appreciate it. Um, that brings us to the end of taking it to Redline. Uh, we definitely want to thank you for jumping on. I mean, this was some awesome dialogue. Uh, before we wrap it up, is there anything you want to plug? I do real quick. I mean, I, I've mentioned it throughout our, our time today, but obviously guys uh, uh, and girls, uh, please uh, stop by stevespov.com. Every video has English subtitles on it. I know I speak Japanese. I know it's not comfortable maybe for some people to watch, but I take a lot of time 
to put proper English subtitles onto every video. There is English in the videos too with Japanese subtitles, but if you, uh, keep in mind, every video has English subtitles. Just turn them on on, on the YouTube player. Uh, that's stevespov.com. Also, if you're in Texas, if you're thinking about moving to Texas, the Dallas-Fort Worth area or anywhere in the state for that matter, I uh, am a realtor. I'm still licensed in California at this moment in time, but I'm working on my uh, Texas license. I can help you here. Please feel free to reach out. My Instagram for that is Cars and Castles. Everything else is Steve's POV. Um, I'm honored that you asked me to be on. Um, I, I hope the Redline News Network uh, grows and continues to be successful. Um, and this is a fun interview. I want to thank you for it. No, we definitely appreciate those kind words, Steve. We'll drop uh, all your contact information in the description box below. Um, so again, I mean, we can't say thank you enough. Um, let's definitely stay in touch. Absolutely. I look forward to it. I wish you luck. Sorry you uh, moved out of Texas, but uh, back up to the East Coast. But please come back. Let's hang out again. Uh, Saturday mornings in Dallas, Texas are fantastic, guys. Um, um, I, I'm really enjoying it here. People have been so welcoming to me. I really feel part of Texas now. I really feel honored to be here. I feel honored every time I go to an event and have people come up to me and say hi um, and, th and, and watch my content. Uh, honestly, it really... It, it, it really rings true. It's hard to uh, express really how, 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 what a good feeling that is. So thank you, Texas. Thank you, everybody watching uh, this interview. And uh, thank you uh, for interviewing me. And, and I hope to uh, meet you in person one day. And we'll take you up on that offer, Steve. So th thanks awesome. again. Um, to the Redline citizens, as a reminder, uh, new episodes of Redline News, where we, where we recap the week in automotive and supercar content, premieres every Friday morning. Don't miss out by clicking subscribe. Um, also, follow us on Instagram to stay up to date on new episodes of Taking It to Redline. Uh, we definitely leave hints on who our next guest will be, so make sure you follow us. Um, until next time, let's keep it at Redline. <laughs>